Good morning, church. Let's stand to our feet as we worship. Let's sing this out together. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. For there's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. to turn our attention to the baptistry. Good morning. How you guys doing today? Morning. That was pretty lame. I got to be honest. Good morning. How you guys doing today? Morning. Are you guys awake now? <laughs> hey, well, now it's officially past 4th of July, so I can tell you guys Merry Christmas. 
I hope you guys already got your trees out and ready to go up. Uh, just joking, man, it has been a great weekend. I hope you had a great holiday weekend. We still know a lot of people are traveling, uh, but today is an exciting day, not for one baptism, but for two baptisms. Uh, and so I'm going to introduce to you the first and the bravest, probably the biggest person I've ever baptized in my whole life. Come on down here. It's warm, ain't it? Ooh. You guys see little Mac? Woo. Man, you guys got to be a little talkative this morning, okay? It's okay. This is Mac. Everybody wave at him. There you go. This is Mike Jacobs. This is uh, the youngest of Frank and Jessica. Uh, and we're going to be baptizing her sister in just a second. Uh, but it's a great proof of what we do here at Green Acres, right? We raise families, uh, we support families, and we have a great children's ministry uh, that puts Jesus in front of everything, right? Uh, and so, Mike, I'm going to ask you, girl, have you asked Jesus Christ into your life? Yes. Yes? Amen. Well, that means I'm going to baptize you. Hold on. we got, we got to give it a second. we got to get adjusted here. All right. You good? They never taught you this in seminary. I'm just telling you. All right? All right. So I'm going to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay. Grab my hand. You ready? Just about two pounds more. Hey, you got to turn the other way, girl. Thank you. You guys remember having kids? They always want to be. Turn one way or the other. I'll sit you on my knee, all right? Like, we're like a little ventriloquist. Beep, beep, beep. Hey, when I talk, when I... You move your mouth. Ready? Move it. Just talk. Hey. <laughs> that work. Hey, well, this, this is Cadence uh, Jacobs. And so she, uh, like her little sister, uh, has asked Jesus Christ in her life, correct? Yes? Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to baptize her. Well, because you've asked Jesus Christ in your life, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You, you, grab me another. There you go. Uh, They look like y'all, but that's kind of hard with one arm. I'm just got to be honest. Hey, well, we are so glad to start off a service this way. And uh, what I want you to do, I want you to stand up, greet somebody, and ask them this question. You ready? When were they baptized? That's a great question. Greet somebody this morning and ask them when they were baptized. Let's continue in worship together this morning. How I long to breathe the air of heaven. Mercy fills the streets to look upon the one who bled to save me and walk with him for all eternity. There will be a day when all will bow before him. Hey! 
stand beside the heroes of the faith and with one voice a thousand generations sing worthy
Bless God in the sanctuary. Bless God in the fields of plenty. Bless God in the darkest valley. Every chance I get, I'll bless your name. Bless God when my hands are empty. Bless God with the praise that cost me. Bless God when nobody's watching. Every chance I get, I'll bless your name. Bless God when the weapons for me. Bless God when the walls are falling. Bless God because he goes before me. Every chance I get, I'll bless your name. Bless God for the roads of victory. Bless God for he's always with me. Bless God for he's always worthy. Every chance I get, I'll bless your name. Every chance I get, I'll bless your name. Every chance I get. Jesus, we praise you this morning for who you are. We praise you, God, in, in any circumstance that we may find ourselves in this morning, whether it be good or bad. God, we praise you no matter what we're going through in our lives. I pray that um, we would just bring forth this offering of worship this morning um, through song as well as through listening to your word and, and hiding it in our hearts this morning. I pray you bless the teaching time. And I just pray that everything we do is for your glory. Amen. 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 You know, it's interesting that uh, the song that you sang, not the doxology, but the, the song before that, Bless God, uh, the words of that, right? To bless God in the seasons uh, of plenty, but bless God's when our valleys are the darkest Bless God when we have everything, and bless God when we have nothing. Uh, those are great worship words, and those are great words for us to sing. But the real question is, do we really mean that? Uh, is that what we actually do? And so today, we're starting a, a quick series, only four weeks, uh, going through another small book of the Old Testament, uh, through the book of Ruth. Uh, I love Ruth. i got to lay that on the table. It is a, an amazing book, and as many times as I read it and study it, uh, I just find something that is new uh, and beautiful uh, about God, even though the book really never hears from God. God never talks. 
He never proclaims. He never says, thus saith the Lord, like we saw in Jonah, uh, like we saw in Joshua, as we've been seeing in Numbers and Leviticus and Exodus and Genesis, as we've been reading. Uh, But here we have a simple love story. Not just a love story of a woman and a man, but also a love story of a God and people. Uh, And so I hope, uh, even though you may have heard Ruth, I know, I even thought about like, man, should I do Ruth? Because I know every woman in the church is probably set in a Bible study uh, from the book of Ruth, right? Uh, It just, it's one of those that's just great, but I love the book. Uh, And one of the reasons for it, right, is what are we doing in 24, right? Right. We are finding Jesus in the Old Testament. Uh, And so how many of you are still reading with us daily? Let me see those hands. Amen, amen. Uh, And so just to whet your appetite, uh, tomorrow morning we read about the red heifers that's been in the news for a year. So uh, just to whet your appetite a little bit. We're reading through the Old Testament one chapter a day, five days a week. Uh, We're starting, I think, Numbers 19 um, tomorrow. So if you haven't joined us, man, it's a great time. Just jump in. Uh, Every day there's a video uh, on Facebook, on YouTube that you can watch. If you need commentary, many of you don't need commentary. You don't have to see my face that early in the morning. Causes indigestion, upset stomach, you know, uh, things that Pepto-Bismol cure. Um, but I understand that the videos are just there for those who want it, those who need it, and for a lot of people that are not in our church. Uh, and so uh, every week people are adding to that, uh, subscribing to that, and watching that. It's just it's been it's been great. Uh, I get lots of great questions. Um, some are really easy. Uh, some debate who's the better donut maker between Krispy Kreme and Raised Donuts, and uh, we'll talk about that later, right? But uh, it, it's been a great time. And so as we've been walking through the Old Testament together, right, Monday through Friday, and then at the beginning of the year, we started reading the book of Joshua or the book of Yeshua, right, which is the same name as Jesus. And it was this idea that this leader, this new leader, Moses died, Joshua becomes the new leader, and he takes them over the river, the river of, I would say, salvation into the promised land, into daily living with God, right? And so we kind of see this New Testament, Old Testament collide in the book of Joshua, And then uh, last week, uh, Pastor Andrew finished up for us, but we did the prophet Jonah, right? Remember Jonah? Got swallowed by a fish, right? And that fish's name in Hebrew is what? There you go, dog. Uh, And so it's a Georgia thing, right? Uh, Dog. And so, uh, and so, but the whole point was Jonah was buried at the bottom for three days, resurrected. Uh, and saved and brought salvation to the Gentiles. A great connection from Jesus uh, to the Old Testament. And today uh, is Ruth. Uh, One good thing about Ruth is in a couple months we're going to read it together Monday through Friday. Uh, Actually two days. We just, uh, I put it all together in two days. Um, But you're getting the, you're getting the highlights right now, right? So in a few months you'll get the, the kind of just, uh, just, just kind of think about it, right, what we've been talking about over the next month. And I want to show you in the book of Ruth uh, just where Jesus is at. And you're going to see so much Jesus in this small little love story of Ruth. Uh, and, uh, and then when school starts in August, we're going to jump to the New Testament, right? We've been in the Old Testament a lot, and I know some of you it's not your thing. So we're going to jump in the New Testament, and we're going to finish out the year uh, with the book of Hebrews, which is in the New Testament, but it's all about the Old Testament, right? So uh, when you get done with 2024, like it or not, you're going to know a whole lot about the Old Testament, uh, and you're going to know a whole lot about Jesus in the Old Testament. And so uh, it's kind um, kind of been my thought and process for 2024. And so when we come to the book of Ruth, there's a couple things that you need to know before we jump into verse one, right? So Ruth is a great book on kind of an insight on how God deals with a regular person. I don't know about you, I would consider myself regular, right? We're not high priest, we're not of the Levite tribe, we're not holy people. Most of us is we're just normal, everyday folk. 
And we're going to see in this four-week love story how God interacts with everyday normal folk. People who mess up, people who run away from God, people who come back to God, people who don't want to be with God, people who follow God, people who don't follow God. There's going to be a lot of people in this story, right? Uh, But it's how God deals with everyday people. The second thing you need to understand is this book, Ruth, happens in the middle or middle to end of the book before it called Judges. We all walk through the book of Joshua together. Israel crossed the Jordan River, came into the promised land. They battled. They took out the middle. Then they went south and defeated everybody in the south. They defeated north. And now they have ran out most of the enemies of the promised land. And they are living in the land that God has promised them, the land that is flowing with milk and honey. And we left Joshua with the highlight, right? Woo, they did it. Yay, God loves them. But as you turn the page and you go to the next book called Judges, Judges are, I would say, probably the darkest time of Israel's history ever. Ever. And I'm just telling you right now, if you don't know the Old Testament, Israel, they've done a lot of bad things, right? They, They disobey God a lot. But when you get to the book of Judges, it is just the grossest just nastiest time of Israel's history. And so while all this is happening in the promised land that they just battled, God gave to them, what happened? Israel said, God, thanks for the land. We don't need you anymore. We don't love you anymore. We're going we're gonna to divorce you, and we're going to go over here and do our own thing. And as they did that, Israel started to plummet and plummet very, very quickly, very quickly. So in the midst of this horrible thing going on in Israel, we get this love story of just a couple people, right? And it's kind of just the the idea. It's the idea of the ultimate love story, right? You remember when you were in school, you had to read, in school you hated it, right? Romeo and Juliet. As an adult, you're like, I I I, I like that now, right? But in the midst of all this war and battle and families just warring against one another, you see Romeo and Juliet, and it's Romeo, Romeo, where for all to my room? And you're like, all the ladies are like, ah, and all the guys are like, this is lame. Why can't they just speak in English, right? Uh, good English, right? Not that old English stuff, right? Uh, and so it's the idea. All this bad happens, but in the midst of darkness, there's always bleaks of little lights. That's the book of Ruth. A lot of bads going on, but a bleak of light. In Judges, in this, that book, chapter 21, verse 25, it says this. In those days, in the days of Ruth... In the surrounding, it says there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Could you imagine? I know it's really hard. It's so hard. you got to put on your thinking cap, right? Could you imagine a time in history where anybody was allowed to do anything that they thought was okay to them? So that's hard to imagine, right? It's hard to imagine. It, 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 you know, you'd say now, right? But now, you just take now and you say, you know, times it, times a thousand. And what's crazy about it is they just came into the promised land. They spent years in battling and running out the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Prezerites. They've seen God do all these miraculous things, stop the sun. He's done this, allow Jericho to fall, the eye to fall in Bethel. And they've seen him in the, in the valley of Mount Gerizim. They've seen God amazingly do things. They've seen God in the tabernacle walking around in the wilderness. They've seen amazing things and now that they're there and God says, well done, they say, okay, we're done with you. I want to do what I want to do, right? And they spend countless of years doing that. So in the midst of this ugliness, we have Ruth. What's interesting about the book of Ruth is Ruth is one of only two books in your whole Bible that's named after a woman, right? What's the other one? Esther, very good. There is, it is the only book in the Old Testament that is named after a Gentile. Ruth was a Gentile. She's not, she, she's not 
uh, from Israel. We'll find more about that today. Now, there is a book in the New Testament named after a Gentile. Anybody know what that's called? The book of Luke. The book of Luke. Luke was a Gentile. Uh, and so uh, maybe a Hellenistic Jew, but he was a Gentile. Uh, and so uh, you have this idea of these books that is named after a woman. It's to do with a woman, which was very, very not normal back in those days. It was named after a Gentile, but it is also the only book that we have in our scripture where it is a descendant of Jesus, right? Uh, and so uh, if you go to Matthew and you read the genealogies, you're going to find uh, Ruth in there. And we'll talk more about that today. So Ruth is a great book for a lot of many reasons, and we're going to talk about that. I'm going to try to point as many things as we can in time as we walk through. Uh, but here's, here's if you're going to say, if you're going to zone me out, right? Here's, here's what you need to hear before you zone me out, okay? The book of Ruth is about, it shows a lot of things, but the thing it shows the most is the word providence. Providence. What that means is it means, it paints a picture of God is the, is the king of all things. His word tells us that all things, all, you know what that word means in, in, in the Hebrew and in the Greek? All, yeah, all things, everything. Everything works To God's glory. God is the sovereign king. Nothing happens and it just surprises God. And he's like, well, I didn't know Sean was going to do that today. Of course he knew it. He's God, right? And so in the midst of all the craziness, we zoom out from the bad, dark, sin-filled uh, Israel, and we zoom in really, really, really tight, right? Like Google Earth. We're just zooming in, zooming in, zooming in, zooming in, and we zoom in on one little family. In the midst of all the crazy and darkness, we see a one little, just, just a glimmer of light in a whole bunch of darkness. So this morning, if you feel like you're in a dark life, if you feel like you're out of the view of God, that God doesn't love you, God has no idea what's going on, this is the book for you. God knows exactly what's going on, and it all has a purpose. It all has a plan, and that's to bring him glory. Not you, not me, because if I have glory, I become really big and my head don't fit through doors. And, you know, so God has to keep us humble, right? Um, because we would be like Israel. God lets Israel into the promised land. And they said, look what we did. We defeated this and we did that. And we, 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 in just a little bit of time, little bit of time, just months go by. And they say, well, I don't need God anymore because I am God. And so here we zoom in on just a little bit of light in a whole lot of darkness. So let's turn to the book of Ruth. Uh, In the Old Testament, chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 1. And it says, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. Now, judges we've talked about. But judges, think of like much like a judge or if it helps you to think, maybe like a little king, a little king, not a big king, but a little king, a ruler. And God set many of these, both men and women, to rule over Israel to help bring them back to God. But they would, they would sin, then God would punish them, and then they would say, oh, we need a leader. And a leader would come in and they'd say, oh, God, we love you, yay. And God would say, okay. I'll I'll heal your land, I'll heal your people, and then everybody got full of food, and they felt better, and they said, okay, God, we don't need you, and that's the book of Judges. It's just a cycle over and over and over again. So in this darkest part of Israel's history, in the Judges, there was a famine in the land. Now, there's lots of reasons in the Bible for a famine, but the one that you will see the most as reading through the Old Testament is simply when there's a famine in the land, Israel's done something wrong. Could you imagine a kid who never gets discipline? Have you been to Walmart recently? They're everywhere, right? They're everywhere, right? Maybe some of you have grandkids that are that way. Uh, We all have neighbors that are that way. But think about that, right? A kid who never gets disciplined, they're they're just not the sweethearts of the the family, right? They're, They're just, oh, they're just terrible, right? 
Well, what happens? When Israel does wrong, God, being the good father, has to discipline them. Well, how does he discipline them? By plagues, by sickness, uh, but by famine. It seems to be when you get hungry and you get thirsty and all of your animals are dying and you're on the verge of death, you say, oh, Lord, I'm so sorry. Will you please send us some food, right? It's kind of always, uh, always pick on students, but it's the same, right? A lot of students don't cry out to God every day, but when they walk in and they see that there's a test and they never knew about it, man, those kids get really religious really quick in third period, right? Oh, dear Lord, please let me remember something that this teacher said, even though I've been on my phone for the last four weeks of class, right? Just let it be there. Let it be there, right? When we're in trouble, we seem to look upward. Well, that's exactly what's happening. In the days of Judges, there was a famine uh, in the land, and a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab. Now, you see that name of that city, right, named Bethlehem. You've seen that before, right, in the Bible? Yes, somebody was born there, right? Who? Jesus. Okay, so when you read the Bible and you see Bethlehem, if you've been reading in the Old Testament with us, you've seen this word before, um, but lots of things happen in Bethlehem. But what you need to know, especially in the book of Ruth, uh, names have meanings. The name of Bethlehem simply means it's the house of bread or the basket of bread. And so if you read this in the original language, you think to yourself, in the house of bread, there was no bread. That's interesting, right? Could you imagine sitting down to Olive Garden or Fazoli's or, Brian, get ready, Texas Roadhouse, and you sit down and they say, sorry, we hate to tell you, we're out of rolls. If you're in my family, we're going to say, we're leaving, we're out. We did not come here for your food, we came here for the bread, right? The bread is what we came here for. And that's exactly what happened. In Bethlehem, in the house of bread, there was no bread. There was a famine. But what happened? There was a man, and he went to sojourn in the country of Moab. The idea of sojourn is not a vacation. It is a prolonged trip. It's a trip that you would take as if he's moving to Moab, but in his mind, in the very back of his mind, one day he does plan to come back to the house of bread. So when he says he took a sojourn, he didn't pack a suitcase, he bought a U-Haul, and he loaded everything in the U-Haul, put the kids in the back, and they were gone, right? I mean, in the very back, right? The very box part. That's where the kids were, right? So he was moving to a place called Moab. Now, I don't know if you know about Moab, but Moab is a bad place, right? When you read Moab in the Old Testament, you should automatically go, ugh, right? That's just kind of the, ugh. Well, why is that? Well, God tells us in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, also in the book of Genesis, but many times in Deuteronomy, that the people of Moab are cursed. If you intermingle with the people of Moab, you will be cursed. When they're coming into the, pro, uh, to the promised land, they were not to inter intertwine with the Moabites. Well, why is that? Moab, Moabites, the people of Moab, today we call it modern-day Jordan. Me and Laura were literally there, exactly what we're talking about today. And so Moab is just across the northern part or the southern part of the Jordan River and the Dead Sea. And it, it's, it, it's a beautiful place, uh, but it, it gets 16 inches of rain a year. That's pretty good when you're living in the desert, right? So when you're standing by the Dead Sea and you look across the Dead Sea and you look across the Dead Sea to Israel, it's the Negev Desert. It's just nastiness. I mean, just as much desert as you can think. In your, in your mind, don't think like uh, sand and dunes. Think like Afghanistan, right? It's very uh, mountainous, rocks, lots of caves and ravines, but there's, there's nothing there. But... If you were on Israel's side looking across the Dead Sea to Moab or modern-day Jordan, it's beautiful. It's green. It's luscious. It's got these nice big hills that literally from the Dead Sea go up, and then it's just, oh, it's just glowing with green, right? If you remember in Joshua, three, two and a half of the tribes, they came to the Jordan River, and they said, hey, it's nice over here. 
we don't want to cross. We want to stay here, a little north of where Moab is, but that's where they wanted to stay. It's the same land. So there was a man in Bethlehem, just outside of Jerusalem, the house of bread. There was no bread. He, one day he looks out his window and he says, man, that looks really green over there. My family's about to starve. What would you do? If your family was about to starve, if you were hungry, there was no more Fruit Loops in the closet, what would you do? Most of us would say, well, we're, we're going to move, right? We're going to move. We're going to move and go over. The problem is, Moab is not in the promised land. So when he says, I'm going to sojourn to Moab, this is what he says. God has given us this land. God has promised us this land. Deuteronomy chapter 28, God says, If you love me and follow my commandments, I will bless you. I will bless you on your table. I will bless you in your life. I will bless you in your job. I will bless your fields. I will bless your animals. I will bless, 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 bless. But if you do not love me, if you do not follow my commandments, I will curse you. I will curse you on your tables. I will curse your livestock. I will curse your fields. I will curse, I will curse, I will curse, I will curse, right? So here is Israel not loving God, not wanting to be with God. And so here's an Israelite that says, I would rather eat of fields of green than to be with God in the fields of famine. Now what would you do? Would you stay and trust God in the famine? Or would you leave God and go to the fields outside of the promised land? Well, the religious people would say, well, Sean, I would stay in the promised land and watch kid after kid after kid after kid die. Your wives die. Your men, your brothers, you'd, you would do that? Maybe some of you would. But this is the predicament that they're in. Israel has gone away from God so far. God is cursing them. And now we come onto the story where there's a man who said, I'd rather be away from God and be full than to be with God and to die of starvation. That's the story. That's the setting, right? And so we go to the country of Moab. Oh, I forgot to tell you. Moab, it starts from a guy named, what do you think his name was? Moab, man, you guys are brilliant this morning. I love this. And you guys know where Moab came from, right? It came from incest. It came from, you remember a place named Sodom and Gomorrah? Remember that, right? And so what happens? Abraham says, hey, go get, go get Lot and tell him to get out of there. And, and they leave, but Lot's life, uh, wife, Lot's wife looks back. She dies, right? And so now it's Lot and his two daughters, and what happens? They have an incestuous relationship, and they name their child Moab. And God curses that incestuous, and he said that you will live. Uh, and he gave them the place, right, on the east side of the Jordan River, Moab, and that's where it is. So that's why they're cursed. That was from the beginning of the curse. And so that's where we're at. So he looks into this bad territory of ungodly people, and he says, I would rather be full without God than to be hungry with God. And he and his wife and his two sons, right? So we have a nice little family. Everybody say, aw. That's good, right? Y'all are terrible for saying that. These are bad people. All right, here we go. The, man, <laughs> the name of the man is Elimelech, and, his wi- and the name of his wife is Naomi, and the names of his two sons are uh, Melon and Kilion, right? So Melon and Kilion. Now, if you learn, you'll learn this as you read the Old Testament, but much like everything, names have meaning, right? Names have meaning, especially uh, in the book of Ruth. It gives us a little insight, right? Uh, I remember um, one time I was in uh, my first full-time church. Uh, I was in western Kentucky, and we went and did a mission trip uh, in Oklahoma, on an Indian reservation. And if I, I'm telling you guys, I would rather lick every inch of Watson Boulevard than to go back to that place. It was the worst place of, of, of ever. Uh, it was just horrible. Just all, all kinds. Laura was pregnant. When I say she was pregnant, she was like any day going to burst pregnant. And so as a pastor, right, you still have to do a mission trip. And every day I would call, Laura, please tell me you're having labor pain. I just needed a reason to leave 
that place, right? But on this Indian reservation, we did a big family camp, and what was interesting was uh, that we learned that on the Indian reservation, a lot of them, they name their children after the first thing they see after the mom gives birth, and you become some weird names. The weirdest of the names that I can remember was uh, the chief, the guy that I dealt with leading this family camp, uh, and his name was... Chief peeing on a stick. Not even lying. I promise you, that was his name. That was his name. And the whole thing, it was a dog. And you're just like, wow. Like, and so can you imagine taking 50, 60 teenagers and getting them ready for this? You know, I mean, middle school boys were losing their mind over this whole idea, right? Well, a lot happens in biblical times, right? When somebody is born, they would name them after things that were happening at that time, right? You think of all the names that they mean. You have the red-haired one, the heel catcher, right? I mean, all the names that we've kind of learned as we're reading through the Bible. But here, uh, you have Elimelech. Elimelech's a beautiful name. It means, my God is king. It's literally his testimony, Right? So his name, every time he says, what's your name? Elimelech, my God is king. What a beautiful name. And then you come to his wife, Naomi. Naomi is pleasantness or sweetness or sweetheart. Everybody say, aw. It's good. It's a good name, right? Then you have his two sons. These these aren't good ones, right? You have Melon and Kilion. Melon means sickly. So he's born and he's sickly. And so the dad says, there shall his name be sickly, right? Oh, that's fantastic, right? And then you get to the other one, Kilion, which means wavering near death. Yeah, these are just beautiful names, right? I mean, just, oh, just me. It just sets, we're just setting the scene here, right? We're just setting the scene. And so you have my God is king and sweetheart and sickly and deathly. Here we go, right? We're in a U-Haul. We're leaving the promised land, and we're going to Moab. But before we get there, we need to know that they were Ephorites from Bethlehem in Judah. And they went into the country of Moab and remained there. There's a lot to say about Ephrites. In our minds today, we would say that Ephra is the county in which Bethlehem was in. That's how we would say it today. Uh, but the Ephrites were this rich family, right? They were the aristocrats of Bethlehem. So here in the story, we know Elimelech and Naomi and Sickly and Deathly, right? They were the well-to-do people, right? They could afford to leave They could afford to pack up their house, take their servants, move over, start a new business, do whatever they needed to do. They were well-to-do. In all of Bethlehem, everybody knew who Elimelech and Naomi were because of their status. They were Ephorites, right? So a lot of this is going on. Now, before we go any further, there's just one thing I want to say In our minds, we read this and we say, man, we would never leave the promised land for Moab. For one, never say never. We've all heard that, right? We would do a lot of things for our families and our kids. But remember, he was on a sojourn. His intention was to come back. He was going to leave God's land, but he was going to come back. He was doing what was best for his family. From Jerusalem... To Moab is less than 40 miles. When you're leaving Jerusalem, it's all downhill until you get to the Jordan River, and then you just have a little whoop, uphill. It's a very easy move. It's a very easy walk. It's a very easy transition. Let me say before we get any further, sometimes, a lot of times, when we walk away from God... It's really easy. It's an easy transition. It's not that far. It's just downhill. We use our mind to say, but my wife is hungry. My kids are hungry. There's better work there. There's this, this. We use lots of excuses, but we just take one little step away from God. And that, what happens? Then we take another little step. And and all of a sudden, we're sitting square dab in the middle of the enemies of God. Right, and so that's what that's what you need to know in the back of your mind. Verse three, but Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left there with her two sons. This is a beautiful Hallmark movie, y'all. 
is coming together very nicely, right? My, my God is king and sweetheart and sickly and deathly. They get to Moab and my God is king. He dies. The man of the house dies. Now it's a mom and two boys. And these, verse 4, took Moabat, Moabite wives. You see that word took there? It's an interesting word. It's the word nasa, nasa. The word nasa is used in the Old Testament quite often, but when it's used in marriage, it's used only nine times in marriage. This is one of them. The other eight times, the word nasa always means when it says they took them in marriage, get in your mind that they literally went, found women that they like, they threw them over their shoulders and said, you are going to marry me. They sex slave them is what we would call them today. They mail order bride. They said, you're going to be my wife. That's the word nasa. There's another Hebrew word, lacha, which means that, oh, she loves him, he loves them. They get together, they have a little wedding. Oh, so cute. That's that word. That's used a lot. But nasa, so when it says they took Moabite wives, they went into Moabite, found the cuties, and said, you are coming with me. And they forced them into marriage. These are God's people, God's children, right? People from the promised land. Dad died, and so now they said, well, we got we to gotta become dad. We got to start having kids. We're not going to do all the work ourselves. We need kids, right? We need cooks. We need cleaners. We need this. We need people to work the ground, right? I don't want to do all this. So they took Moabite wives, which for one is prohibited. In the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 7, God forbids it. Deuteronomy chapter 23, uh, he forbids it. So just notice this. I'm hungry with God. Oh, look over there. It's got some food. Okay, I'm just going to go over there for a little bit, but I'm going to come back. And they go over. Oh, man, we're here. The food's good. Oh, wow, what happened? Dad died. Oh, I, I, I need to marry. Well, am I going back to Israel? No, they don't have any food. I'm going to take... For me, right, another step. You see this? They just little transitions farther and farther and farther away from God. They took these Moabite wives. One was named Orpah. That's not Oprah, okay? If you see Oprah, you're dyslexic. Get that checked, right? Orpah. And the other is Ruth. Now, Orpah, uh, her name is, means stiff-necked. It's a beautiful name for a lady, right? You know what that truly means today? We all know Orpahs. You know what it means? It means this. It's what it truly means to look up. Nose in the sky, right? Oh, I'm too good for you. Oh, I'm this. That's that, right? And for some reason, guys like those kind of girls. Oh, she's beautiful. Oh, yeah, yes. Oh, I was like, right? And so, so, and so Kilion, right, he marries Orpah. Oh, she's too good. But then we have Ruth. Uh, and Ruth married uh, Melon, right? So this is the connection, right? So we kind of we kind of have this beautiful relationship going on. They lived there for about ten years, and both Melon and Kilion died. This is getting better and better, so that the women were left without two sons and her husband. Now, what's interesting, right? They move from Israel. They come to Moab. They take wives, and for 10 years, man and woman are sleeping together every single day. In the Old Testament, that would mean that they should have what? Children, but they don't have children. We learn nothing about children. Why? Because they've been living outside of the blessing and promise of God for 10 years. God is disciplining them all along. You need to go back. Why isn't this working? Why is this happening? God is being a good father, and he's trying to get their attention to come back to, to his blessing, to his promise, to the place that he has had from them all the way since the beginning of Genesis 12 when he promised it to their great, 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 great granddaddy, Abraham. Right? And so they died, and so now the women are left without their two sons. Right? So that means, just so that you know, they're poor. They're probably homeless. Uh, they've kind of spent through their savings. There's nothing they could do. Women didn't work that much. Um, a lot of times they couldn't buy a lot of things uh, because it was a man's job to, to buy, to purchase. So now you have these poor homeless women that are, are there and no one to take care of them when they get sick. 
In verse 6, Then she arose with her daughter-in-laws to return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord has visited his people and given them food. She arose. Who? Naomi. And Naomi, as she has nothing, her husband has died, her sons have died. She's there as a widow woman with her daughter-in-laws who are of a different descent, who have a different God, who have a different idea, and they're just there. And she's like, okay, what's going to happen? She's hit rock bottom. She's gone as low as she can go. It's usually when we hit rock bottom that we eventually start to look up out of the pit, right? God disciplines us so that we will look up. And so here's Naomi and what happens. Notice all of a sudden, out of nowhere, verse 6, she says, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back to Israel because why? That the Lord, notice that, Lord, it's capitalized in your Bible. That's Yahweh, the covenant name of Israel, right? The, the Yahweh had visited his people and given them food. Remember I said about judges, judges happened in cycles. Israel was against God. God would send a judge or a leader. He would pull them back into repentance and confession and God would bless them. But then they hated God again, and they kept doing this and doing this. So while she's over here in Moab, she's missing out on God visiting Israel again and blessing them, and now the house of bread has bread again. Woo! You know, Olive Garden, they have more breadsticks. Texas Roadhouse, they got the rose back. And so now everybody in Israel is reaping the blessing, the food, the encouragement. They're living a good life again. And now here's Naomi and her two daughter-in-laws looking over, much like they did 10 years ago, and says, man, there's nothing here. Look, it's so green over here. So what happens? Okay, we'll go back. You didn't know they played ping pong in the Bible, but they do. They keep going back and forth, right? This is what's happening. And so she said that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So they set out from the place where she was with her two daughter-in-laws, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. Notice it says they went, right? So you have uh, Orpah, Naomi, and Ruth, all three of them. They're coming back to Israel. But notice that word that they use. They went on their way to return. Return. You know what that word is called in the New Testament? Repent. They were walking on a road away from God, and they looked back and said, Man, it, it's better with God. And they repented. They turned 180 and started walking back towards God it doesn't matter how long you've walked down the road away from God if you want to see God all you have to do is just simply turn around you'll see God you might be far away from God but you'll see him and now you'll walk to him right and that's the word here so they return to the land of Judah Judah if you if you're interested means land of praise that's the good place the promised land right uh, but, but Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, Go, return each of you to your mother's house. Naomi, being the old woman, right? She said, Listen, you guys got to go back. You guys are Moabites. I'm going to Israel. They hate you there. They literally hate you there. You look different. You smell different. You talk different. You worship different. They don't love you. Baby, baby, just go home. Just go home. Naomi is being nice. Go to your mother's house. Why her mother's house? Well, Moabites believed in polygamy, right? One, one father with many wives. And so when it says to her mother's house, it's because a father really didn't care about the kids. It was the mom who cared about each kid, right? So every woman would have a house and the dad would visit. Much like sister wives if you watch TLC. Um, this is still going on, y'all. It's nothing new under the sun. Uh, each of her to her mother's house. May the Lord, notice this, capital L, may Yahweh, may the covenant God of Israel do what? Deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead, with the dead and with me. Notice this word, deal 
kindly. We're going to use this word a lot as in the next couple weeks. It's the Hebrew word chesed. Everybody say that. Chesed. 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 It's an important word, right? Chesed. It means faithful or loyalty. And so here, Mama is praying over her daughter-in-laws to the covenant God of Israel, not to the God of Moab, but to the covenant God of Israel, and she's praying, deal kindly with you. May the God of the Israel, God of the Jews, may he be loyal and faithful to you who he has already cursed. You would think, wow, that seems... It seems kind of weird, right? He's cursed them. He's forbid Israel to be. But Mama, right, she, she loves them. She's, they have stuck with her. Even though her husband has died, her sons have died, they've stuck. there is a bond here. And she says, hey, may Yahweh have chesed over you. May he be loyal and faithful to you. May, we, may Yahweh keep you and have you, deal kindly with you as you have dealt with with the dead and with me. And the Lord, you've seen that a lot now in the last couple of verses, right? And now Yahweh grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Once again, not only is she saying that Yahweh be faithful and loyal to you, but now she's asking Yahweh, help my daughter-in-laws find new husbands. May they find rest in in a man who can give them kids. May God be faithful and loyal to the people that the rest of the world hates. Just a little message there, right? And she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. They lifted up their voices. We see this oftentimes in the Gospels presented, but we would call this today welling or grief, right? Much like at a funeral. (gasps) Right? Mom, I'm going to miss you. You made the best sweet potatoes I've ever had, right? You kind of have that idea, right? They've lived with her for 10 years. They've been under her management, under her care, even though the shape that they were married to her sons. We all know men don't do anything, right? Mama is the one, right? Mama's the one that runs the family, right? So now Mama's saying, hey, ladies, just go back. Go back. Find you a new man. May God be faithful to you. And now we start the highlight of the chapter. And they said to her, no, we will return with you to your people. And Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Mama, we're not going to leave you. We're we're with you through thick or thin. Mom, we're with you. And, and, And Naomi says, no, baby. Naomi knows. She was an aristocrat. She had money. She knows the people of Israel. She remembers them slaughtering and killing Moabites. And now, Moabite women with no husband, which means they have no job, they have no poor, they're going to be poor. She knows when they get to Israel, it's going to be very bad for them. It's not just going to be bad, it's going to be bad for Naomi as an Israelite going back with no husband. As a widow, nobody take care of her. But now to go back as a mother, she knew it would be, uh, it would be almost a death wish. Mm. Baby, no, you, you stay here. And she asked, have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Now, if you're just picking up with us in the book of Ruth, you might not understand. But if you've been reading through the Bible, we've seen already glimpses of this, right? A Leverite marriage. Or a leveret marriage, however you want to pronounce it. Either way is fine, right? A leveret marriage just means that if, you, if a mom has several kids, several boys, and these boys marry, and one of, the, one of the sons dies before they could have a male offspring to, to take his name on. That in the Old Testament, the next brother in line, wife, would give this person a child so that the name would carry on, right? So, so for example, this is going to sound gross, but I'm just helping you paint this out, right? Toby and Taylor, my two sons, Toby's the oldest, Taylor's the youngest, right? They both get married, right? Toby dies. 
in the Old Testament, it would be he dies before he has a son. It would be the job of Taylor to lay with Toby's wife so that she would become pregnant and that she would have a boy and he would have to keep doing that until she has a boy as well as laying with his own wife and producing his own offspring. So the family name would continue on. Why is that important? Because Israel acted in tribes and clans. And if the family tree broke, man, you would see that tree start to fall very, very quickly, right? And so, and so you have Naomi, an old lady, she says, am I pregnant? Why would you go back with me? I don't have any sons to give you. Both of my sons are dead. You're going to be a widow and homeless for, forever. There's no Israelite in the promised land that's going to marry you. Why would you come back with me? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night, I should bear sons. Would you therefore wait until they were grown? She said, even if I found a man tonight and I became pregnant tonight, would you wait 15, 16 years for that boy to grow up before you would have? You know, you would be 30 or 40 sleeping with a 14, 15-year-old boy. Would you wait that long? No, you wouldn't do that. So, baby, turn back. That's what she's saying. Would you there wait for their groan? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me. Notice that. Exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. It is exceedingly bitter. Bitter to me. Have you ever been a place in your life where you were exceedingly bitter? We've all been there, right? Exceedingly bitter. This is a hard thing for Naomi to say, right? This is hard. She really does want her daughter in law to come, but she knows it's not. And so now she is turning inward, right? She's becoming angry. It's all about her. And she says, I've become exceedingly bitter to me for the sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Hand of the Lord, that's what we call Exodus language, right? It points back to Pharaoh. The hand, the power of God has gone out in me, right? Naomi is not saying, well, we left God. We walked away from God. We did this, we did this, and we did this, and, you know, understand what God has done. No, she's walked away from God, and now she said, it's all God's fault, God turned his back on me. God killed my husband. God killed my sons. God put me in this position, right? That's what she's saying. God's hand has gone out against me. It is basically saying God is my enemy. And a lot of us were like, wow. But if we were honest, we've been there. We've been there. We blame God for a whole lot. Even though that... We took a step to Moab. We took wives. We lived there for 10 years. And we look back of all the times that we walked away from God, and we turn around and look at God and say, it's all your fault. And God's like, are you kidding me? Let me remind you of all the times that you walked away from me. Are you kidding me? And they lifted up their voices and wept again. <gasps> They're welling, right? And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. Remember, a few verses back, right, verse 9, Naomi kissed Orpah and Ruth. She was kissing them goodbye, but now Orpah kisses her mother-in-law, and she walks away off the pages of history. We never hear from her again in the, in the, whole, in the whole world. We have no idea who she is. But Ruth clung to her. But Ruth clung to her. And she said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Naomi says, listen, Ruth, I know you love me and I love you and I really don't want you to go. But look, Orpah is left. Please go with her. Go back to her people and her God and her language and her way of living. You will find another husband. You will be good. Please go back. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, bum, 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 bum. In a, in a Hallmark movie, this is where they break away to commercial. 
right? And you have to wait three and a half minutes to see what they're going to say, right? Building suspense. Ruth clung to her and said, no, I'm not going to leave. What is she going to say? And Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Ruth, this young girl who's already lost her husband, said, no, Mama, I, I want to go with you. Right? I, I, I want to go with you. Wherever you're going to go. And you can imagine, in between the lines of Scripture, Naomi is explaining, listen, baby, you don't even know what Israel's like. They're going to hate you. You look different. You smell different. You just, they're going to spit on you. They're going to hate you. You're never going to get a man. You're going you're gonna to die never knowing, uh, laying in a bed with a man again. You're going to die uh, homeless. You're going to die starving to death. You're going to be begging for the rest of your life. You can imagine her, uh, the mother-in-law is explaining the situation and what she's asking to go for. But she still answers your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. It was at that time that people thought gods were geographical, right? In Egypt, they worshipped the gods of Egypt. In, the God, in Moab, they worshipped the gods of Moab. In Canaan, they worshipped the gods of the Canaanites, right? That gods all had a, a geographical location. And so here is this Moabite woman who probably has spent her whole life worshipping a god named Chemosh. Chemosh is the Moabite god. And, uh, and, she, and now she's switching to another God. She's moving location. She's going back to Israel, to the promised land. And she says, my God will be your God. Naomi, whatever you worship, I, I will do that. And then she even makes a promise, when you die, I will die in the exact same place. And she prays to God, may the Lord, may Yahweh do the same to me. And more also, if anything, but death parts me from you. Ruth said, Mom, mother-in-law, I'm with you to the end, no matter what. And if I leave you, may God, may the God of Israel curse me and punish me. This is the most important part of Scripture in the book of Ruth. This woman, a Gentile, cursed Moabite woman, says, no, I will go back to Israel with you. And you say, wow, is it, is it really that important? Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty important. Like, well, I mean, she's from Moabite. What does she have to lose? Let me help you paint the picture, right? We're in about 1300 B.C., okay, somewhere in that time range. Uh Greece is building what is known as the golden era of Greece. China is building what is known as the Zhou dynasty, which was the biggest and greatest dynasty of China. Let me bring it a little bit closer. In South America, the Mayans are building the biggest civilization in the Americas that have ever been. There's a lot going on in the world at this time, okay? We don't think about that because we're in the Bible, right? But there's a lots of things going on in the world in these times. But one little girl decides, I'll, I'll go to Israel. I'll, I'll go back home with you, Naomi. I, I, know, I, know I, know, I know my other sister-in-law, she, she left. I know, but I'll go with you. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And to fast forward, in case if you never come back, I want you to know how it works out, right? Ruth goes, marries a man. They have a baby boy. His name is Obed, and he lives in Bethlehem. And Obed uh, gets married, and he has a boy, and his name is Jesse. And he gets married and still living in Bethlehem, and he marries a woman, and they have a son, and his name is David, King David. The David in which the prophecy that Jesus would come out of, if there was no Ruth, there would be no Jesus. 1,300 years later, there will be a vision given to some men from Babylon or from Iraq that would come over, uh, come westward because they were following a star. And he said, tonight in Bethlehem, 
a boy will be born and he is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. It's all because Ruth went back to Bethlehem. A cursed woman that felt like they were away from God was still in the plan of God. You can never run too far from God. You can never outrun the vision of God. You can never run the sovereignty of God, the providence of God. You can never outdo anything that God is doing. God will work all things for his glory. And so when we come to this little girl, it's so important. Verse 18, and when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. Have you ever met a woman who made up her mind and you can't change it? You just shut up and go to the restaurant that she wants you to go to, right? It is. You just do what you do, right? She knew, right? Woman, no women, right? Oh, she's got her mind made up. She said no more. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came into Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman said, is this Naomi? You have to read it that way, right? She's been gone for over 10 years. An aristocrat, a rich person of Bethlehem, had left with her, her husband, my God is king, Abimelech, right? And he comes over and he says, we're going to Moab and we're going to make a good life while all you guys are starving. And now, Cinderella fashion, right? She comes back and they're saying, this is not the Cinderella at the ball. What is that, Naomi? Man, she's been gone 10 years, but she looks like 80 years older. She's an old woman who's been living out in the desert with no husband. She's sad. She's hungry, has no son. She's been working and doing all that she can to feed her and her sister-in-laws. She probably has not aged very well. She's probably wearing a different style of clothing coming back than when she left. The caravan of when she left is much smaller than just her and a Moabite woman coming back. And all the town is saying, is that Naomi? Is that Naomi? I mean, they're getting on Facebook, putting pictures. Have you seen Naomi now? What? She did not age well, you know. I remember her in the yearbook, right? That's what they're talking about, right? And so they're saying, is this Naomi? And Naomi said to them, do not call me Naomi. Do not call me pleasant. Do not call me sweetness. Do not call me sweetheart. Call me Mara. She changes her name. Call me Mara. Now, when you read that, you're like, that's kind of weird, right? But she says, don't call me sweetness. Don't call me pleasant. Don't call me uh, sweetheart. Call me Mara. Call me bitter. Wow. Time has changed you, right? Sweetheart, pleasant, but now call me bitter. God's hand is against me. God's hand took my husband. God's hand took my sons. God's hand pulled me out of the promised land. God's hand made me hungry. God's hand made me beg for food. Don't call me sweetheart. Don't call me pleasant. Call me bitter. Have you been there before? We've all been there before. Call me bitter, for the Almighty has dealt dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full. I went away with a husband and sons and money and prosperity and goodness. And I have brought back empty, nothing, no husband, no sons, no money, no house, no horses, no camels, no nothing. I'm empty. Why call me pleasant, sweetness, sweetheart, when the Lord has testified against me? Now, when you read that, you're like, okay, that makes sense. But notice what Naomi's saying. Why call me pleasant and sweetness when the Lord has testified against me? Where was Naomi? Where's Naomi been for 10 years? She's been in Moab, right? But Yahweh is the God of the promised land. 
He's the God of Israel. He's been over here punishing and disciplining, but now that he's been bringing back to the fields. Remember, that's why she wants to come back. Yeah, I've heard that the Lord is working in Israel, and they have plenty to eat, and so we'll go back. The Lord has been here, but listen, the Lord has also been in the rocks of Moab, the cursed nation. The place where nobody should go and nobody should intermarry. Israelites should never be. Even though God was working in his people all in Israel, God still had an eye for the people he loved in Moab. For the Israelite woman whose sons married Moabites, who broke the law, who broke the covenant, who went against the curses of God, who in all means should be kicked out of the tribe of Israel, should be kicked out and never let back in, God still saw. God was still watching. God still knew what was going on. You can never get away from God. God is always there. The Lord testified against me in Moab, And the Almighty has brought calamity on me. She's saying, God has seen me, and God is powerful enough to bring everything. She's saying, God is God. God is the Almighty. God is powerful. He's powerful enough to to make the fields in Israel grow, but he's also powerful enough to change the heart of a woman all the way in Moab. We finish with the last verse. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. They came back to the house of bread when there was bread. They left because there was no bread, and they returned when the bread was coming fresh out of the oven. The barley harvest is the first harvest of several harvests in Israel's history, uh, in in their their agricultural plan, right? So this is right around springtime. Barley's the first thing that's come, and so they're coming back in, and now they have no husband, they have no food, they have no money, they have no jobs, but they're coming back in when Israel is booming and food is plentiful, and that sets the story for next week. They're hungry, so when you're hungry, what do you do? You get food, right? Well, that's what we're going to see in chapter 2. Why is this so important? I mean, you can see God moving all around, but I hope you realize there's no place that's outside of God's sight. No matter how far you've ran, no matter how far you've disobeyed, no matter how many commandments and laws and verses you've broken in the Bible, listen. God sees you, God knows you, and God loves you. God still has a plan for you to come back. From the very beginning of Scripture to the very last page, God is working to get you back to Him. How do you come back to God? It's the same as Naomi. You got to turn around, you got to repent, you just got to turn back and come to God. God sent his son Jesus to die on a cross so that we wouldn't have to pay the penalty. right? When we break the rules, we break the laws, the Bible says that God is just. And because he's just, there has to be a penalty. God doesn't just cover his eyes and say, oh, you're good enough and you're good enough. Because by definition, he would say some people are not good enough. And that would make an unfair God. So God says if you break the law, you deserve the court date. You deserve the sentence. But God knew that we could never pay that court sentence. We would die. We would be eternally separated from God. So God sent his son Jesus, who was born in Bethlehem, who was a great, 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 of this Ruth. So that a man who was man and God, who could take the full wrath of God, but yet still live. Died on a cross, buried three days, resurrected to ascend to the right hand of the Father so that he can intercede for me and you. That while we're running away from God, he's there. Look at Naomi. Father, look at Naomi. 
oh, look at Naomi. Send this, do this, and this. And God is all working not to bring you harm, not to punish you, not to move you further away from him, but God is working all things to bring you back to him. But he didn't make you a robot. He gave you a decision. And your decision is simply this. Do I keep running away from God? Or do I stop running and I turn back to God? When you turn back to God, yeah, there, there's a long road to him. But every step is good and it's better than your other step going that way. God's eye is on you, no matter how far you are. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the story of Ruth, this little love story uh, of these women going on, Father, that we can start to see glimpse of how much you truly love people. Father, we thank you so much for all that you have done in our life. Father, every single one of us has ran away. We have moved away. We've been running to the mountains of Moab, but yet you still watched us, you found us, and you were there when we turned around. Just like the parable of the prodigal son. When the son wanted to come home, the father was waiting and watching on the hill. Father, at times we run and we move away. But this morning we've seen how you still love us. You're still there waiting for us to come home. You are the God of Hesed. You are the God of faithfulness, of loyalty. That even though we are unfaithful, even though we are unloyal, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place. That any person who would believe of Jesus' sacrifice, that they would be welcomed into the arms of the Father. Father, we thank you for this beginning the story of Ruth. Of just being a daily reminder of how much you truly know what we're doing, watching over us, and are caring for us. And Father, if there's somebody here this morning that is running away from God, like Naomi and Abimelech, that you would remind them that your eyes upon them. And that you are not against them, but you are for them to come back to the Father. To come back to salvation. To come back to the promised land. To come back to have a relationship with their creator. Father, we love you. We thank you so much. In your precious name, amen.